Hello, welcome to another edition of At Home with the Roosevelts. I'm Paul Sparrow, the director of the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum in Hyde Park, New York. And today we're going to talk about the relationship between two of the most important families, political families in American history during the 20th century, the Roosevelts and the Kennedys. And to assist me in this conversation, I'm joined by the director of the JFK Library. Paul, it's good to be with you. Alan Price here. Thank you for joining me today, Alan. This is really one of the most interesting and complicated relationships, uh, multi-generational relationships, two families that are really dynasties uh, in, in the way they impacted American political life. Uh, and it, there's a component of this that a lot of people don't really understand. Not only was there a relationship between uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Joseph Kennedy, uh, but there was a very incredible relationship between Eleanor Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll start with the beginning, uh, which is the relationship between uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Joe Kennedy. Joseph Kennedy made most of his money in the 20s in the stock market. Um, and when Franklin Roosevelt became president, one of the things he did was he appointed Joseph Kennedy as the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, which was sort of, as he said, putting the fox in charge of the hen house. Um, then th this created a... Uh, relationship between the two of them in which Joe Kennedy really became a very close confidant of, of FDR, ending up as the ambassador to the court of St. James. Yes. You want to talk about how he managed sure. that uh, posting in London right before the war? Well, it is an interesting time. I, I almost want to go back just a tiny bit before that. As you could imagine, uh, when young people are in the age where they're graduating from high school, whoever is the president in that moment, I think, uh, has a profound impact on them and shapes their view of the presidency. And uh, FDR is the president as JFK comes of age and through his young adulthood. And I think much of his vision of what is leadership and what is the nation is very much informed by FDR. Uh, and so I think that's a big part of it. Clearly, uh, through his father, uh, Joseph, and the posting at the Court of St. James. He has direct connection to what that service might look like. Uh, there is a moment when, when the German U-boat sinks the first UK uh, ship, and, uh, and uh, JFK is asked by his father to look after the uh, surviving U.S. Uh, passengers and their families uh, in that transition. So he actually gets a little bit of responsibility in that moment. Uh, and so I, I think it's, it informs his notion of public service. Ultimately, he goes and, uh, and signs up to go to war, uh, ultimately uh, finally being accepted into the Navy with his father's help a little bit. And, uh, and I think to go to war under a president the only president you've really been conscious of as an adult uh, can't help but uh, impact your sense of what is leadership in the future. And because um, John F. Kennedy was in England uh, in this period immediately prior to the war with his father as the ambassador, he uh, wrote a book about, yes. uh, about it. You want to talk about that book just a second? Sure. Well, in addition to being in England and from there uh, touring through different parts of Europe, he observes uh, uh, ultimately the, the lead up to World War II. And, uh, and some of that was intentional in terms of his research for his uh, thesis at Harvard. And he ultimately turns that thesis into a book, Why England Slept. And I don't know that it, it pays all that much attention to his father's role in that. Uh, but he, he looks at um, what is the build up to... Um, Later, I think it informs his view of the Cold War and how do you respond. So it's an interesting time. Interestingly, that, that book, uh, John F. Kennedy gave a copy of the book to Franklin Roosevelt, uh, and JFK signed it, and Franklin Roosevelt signed it. So we have, you know, FDR collected rare books and, and other things, and uh, that's one of our most precious possessions is the... Uh, while well, England slept with both JFK and Roosevelt's signatures in it. Um, you may not know this story. It's one of my favorite uh, little anecdotes. In 1940, when um, Kennedy came back from uh, Europe, uh, he came to visit uh, the FDR library, which was under construction at the time. It hadn't been opened yet. It didn't open until 1941, but it was under construction. And he left a gift for FDR. 
Really? And uh, we have the note that F the thank you, a copy of the thank you note that FDR wrote to JFK. Um, and it's sort of a scribbled note, so it's a little hard to read, but it appears to say, thank you for the machine gun and goggles. Oh, um, really? Which everyone was sort of like, could you imagine John F. Kennedy dropping off a machine gun at the presidential library with the guards and security? <laughs> well, actually, what it said was marine gun. Uh, which was a spear gun for fi for fishing because he knew FDR yeah. loved to go fishing and loved to be in the water and the goggles were, you know, for like swimming. swimming goggles. Oh. So uh, we've never been able to find what happened to the, the spear gun or the goggles, but it does sort of go to the relationship that the two families had, which was that they were they were close. Um, they were. They were. There was a lot of intersections through the years, no question. And obviously um, the continuing conversation between JFK and Eleanor is also significant in JFK's rise. Yeah, the period when, um, right before the United States gets into the war, when Joseph Kennedy is the ambassador, he starts really siding with uh, Germany. Uh, and he's telling Roosevelt and anybody who will listen that he doesn't think England will survive and that he thinks America needs to find a way to get peace uh, with Germany, and this creates a real friction between him and uh, the president, and also, I believe, a little bit of friction between him and his sons. Yes, I, I think uh, it's a good bit of friction, and as you can imagine, inside the Kennedy family, uh, to to go against your father would have been a tough, tough road to go. Yeah, well, Joseph Kennedy almost ran against FDR in 1940. It wasn't clear that he, FDR was going to run because it was an unprecedented third term, uh, and at that point, Kennedy felt, you know, that he had something to offer, not to mention significant funds to support his candidacy. Uh, but FDR kept him in England just long enough to prevent him from running and then brought him back and they parted ways and it eventually became quite nasty between the two of them. FDR did serve long enough that a lot of people at least thought about running against him. <laughs> Very true. But then, you know, when when war broke out, the um, John F. Kennedy joined the Navy. Um, yes. Talk a little yeah. bit about that, how that experience influenced his presidency and influenced his view of FDR as the commander in chief. Well, yeah, and a lot of people recognize today the exceptional circumstances of his joining the Navy. Uh, he overcame a lot of physical disabilities. He was disqualified uh, for naval service due to lower back injuries, um, which had gone back a long time. And he, and he had a number of other um, uh, maladies. Uh, his father joked about him that if a mosquito bit JFK, the mosquito would die, that he just seemed to be sick all the time with different maladies. And, uh, but he did want to join the Navy. Uh, he, even though he was initially rejected or disqualified, he appealed to his father to intervene on his behalf uh, and in, conf uh, in conversation with... Uh, uh, a lead naval person, uh, Office of Naval uh, Operations, I believe it was. Uh, he was uh, initially assigned to a desk job. Uh, President Kennedy didn't want a desk job. He wanted to go to the front, and then he was uh, given a command of PT boats uh, in the Pacific Theater. So uh, certainly uh, all those operations very much informed his sense of public service and um, and his and deepened his appreciation for democracy, and knew that democracy was under assault uh, from uh, a world that did not believe in that kind of freedom. Uh, he he said even in his uh, debates with uh, candidate Nixon and uh, the famous televised debate, he his address to the nation at that point is, uh, you know, can America live? half can the world live half free and half slave uh he actually referred to lincoln in that speech although lincoln was talking about uh, a literal slavery domestically and kennedy was referring to democracy versus communism but he, it's an interesting take on the world and i think uh in large part that is grounded by his service in world war ii there was another uh, incident during World War II that I think had enormous influence on John F. Kennedy, which was the death of his older brother, Joseph. Yes. Joseph was quite a hero. Yes. And according to the, the family dynamics of that time, uh, his older brother was to, the, to be the one who went into politics. 
and JFK was to play a supporting role. And when his older brother passes away, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, in a in a bombing run in which the bombs went off prematurely before they were discharged from the plane, uh, it, his his father Joseph turned to him as it was now his turn to lead the family into politics, which uh, was an interesting identity shift for him. I think much of his younger life, he gets away with being friendly and well-liked, but not all that serious a student, uh, and not all that serious uh, a player in the world. And, uh, and it's only through seeing the war develop, and then you know his last couple of years at Harvard really focusing in his studies, and then certainly his naval service, I think it becomes just a much more serious person in understanding how the world works. So when, uh, when World War II ends, uh, FDR has died, dies in, in April, uh, and the world changes, um, and we enter into a new phase in the relationships between the Kennedys and the Roosevelts, because now the primary relationship becomes between Eleanor Roosevelt, who is arguably the most powerful woman in America, certainly one of the most famous women in the world, uh, and a major force within the Democratic Party, um, yeah. their political careers start to intersect. Um, and it really happens uh, when Kennedy becomes a senator and Eleanor has very different political views than he does. You want to talk about how that evolved? Well, sure. I think, and, and you can correct me if I'm, if I'm off on this, I think a, a large uh, bit of the early schism uh, revolves around Senator McCarthy and Senator McCarthy's relationship with the Kennedys. And even when the Senate uh, votes to censor McCarthy, and Kennedy had a speech ready to support that censure, uh, but he was in the hospital and unable to deliver that speech. And I think because he's not able to publicly distance himself from McCarthy when others are, I think Eleanor infers from that and the, the ongoing family relations between the McCarthys and the, and the Kennedys, that uh, he may not be as strong a candidate uh, and may not share the same values that she shares and, and I believe engages in some public criticism of Kennedy as maybe not being the right candidate. And Kennedy, uh, I think wisely, does not engage in a public battle with Eleanor Roosevelt. I think he would not win that battle. Uh, but just very privately writes her and, and asks her to consider the facts and, and be open to meeting with him. And it's only in the in-person conversations that his genuine uh, curiosity, his willingness to learn, and his patriotism come through to her in a way that she can support him. But I can, I can appreciate, given what she knew at the time and her greater familiarity with Adlai Stevenson, why it was difficult for her to wrap her mind around Kennedy. And I think, uh, I think Bobby Kennedy's role as one of the counsels to the Senate committee that McCarthy was leading uh, certainly tarnished uh, JFK in her eyes as well. Yes, a little yeah. guilt by association there. Um, right. But there's no question that uh, she was an Adlai Stevenson supporter. Uh, she was very strong on civil rights. She didn't feel the Kennedys were strong enough in supporting civil rights, um, either in the Senate or later. Uh, and I think she really uh, held a grudge, to be honest. Um, I love Eleanor Roosevelt, but she could hold a grudge uh, <laughs> against his father, Joe. I mean, she still resented the fact that he had, you know, criticized uh, FDR during the war and had supported Germany over England. And I think she never fully let go of that uh, axe that she liked to grind. But right. I, I do think there's a wonderful moment in their relationship. And they, if you come here to visit um, Eleanor's home up at Valkill, uh, they have pictures on the wall. Uh, after the um, convention, when Kennedy gets the Democratic nomination, uh, he knows he has to win her over. Uh, and he goes to visit her up in um, uh, Valkill. And we have some of those photos in our library as well. Uh, yes, he has to go in person to Valkill to meet with her. Uh, again, she's enamored uh, and a big supporter of Adlai Stevenson as being a very, very bright and capable candidate. And she's worried uh, not only about Kennedy's uh, relationship with McCarthy, but his overall, uh, his age and inexperience. She, she doesn't think he's got a strong enough record to run on. And it's only in person uh, that he's able to convince her. So I think 
I think that's true to who Kennedy was throughout his life. Uh, there's so much evidence of once people met him, he was the one voted most likely to succeed. He won people over. He had a smile that was uh, completely disarming and charming. And I think that there's no amount of correspondence that's going to convey that. It has to be done in person. And although Eleanor Roosevelt had some objections to uh, Jack Kennedy, she hated Richard Nixon. <laughs> when, it, when it came down to picking one of those, that was an easy choice for her. Yes. And one of my favorite letters that she's ever written is the letter she wrote to uh, JFK the day after the first televised debate between Nixon and JFK. Um, and it's, it's classic Eleanor Roosevelt in its passive-aggressive um, compliment criticism. Um, one of the, the sort of tone of the letter is, you know, uh, I was watching the debate last night with some friends and although I thought you did very well, I thought I would share some of their comments with you. <laughs> um, and she, interesting side note here, uh, one of the people she was watching the debate with was Lloyd Benson. Oh, really? You may remember many years later, uh, in yes. a famous reference during a vice presidential debate to Dan Quayle oh, yes. that I knew John Kennedy and you're no John Kennedy. <laughs> yes. That Lloyd Benson. But one of the things she says is that uh, he came across as too confident. Uh, mm -hmm. and that he needed to include the audience more in his answers. I think you might agree with me if, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> but it's a, it's a classic letter. But, you know, it, Eleanor's credit, she campaigned for him uh, quite vigorously. And she did, you know, what she felt needed to be done for the Democrats to win. Because, again, at, at that point, she felt it was vitally important. Uh, she had had uh, repeated run-ins with Eisenhower, completely disagreed with his policies, and really felt it was important for a Democrat to get in. And she hoped, obviously, to resurrect some of the New Deal uh, policies that she had supported so strongly when her husband was president. Um, but then you get into, once Kennedy gets elected, the first thing he does is he appoints Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes. Yes, it's, uh, it's fascinating. You know, I think not just for that campaign, but for presidential campaigns writ large, it's always an interesting challenge uh, particularly when Kennedy is trying to uh, frame himself as standing up for a new generation, right? We have um, we have new ideas and a new energy, and you're trying to be new, new, new. And at the same time, he knows full well that if he doesn't win over the establishment, he's going nowhere. So he, he has to get Eleanor's support while at the same time creating this image of really just trying to get out uh, young voters. And, uh, and I think that's fascinating. Uh, but he has, a, I think, a really good sense of history, uh, but some, some new ideas and some new energy. And I think one of the things he gets from FDR is the importance of, I'll just call it innovation, in leadership. Uh, and FDR did some really innovative things. When I think about, uh, you know, I'm just going to go off on retreat, not talk to anybody, and I'm going to come back with this Lend-Lease idea. I mean, that's just... You know, it just turns the war. And, uh, and I think uh, President Kennedy knew that there, you needed to take time to think about the bigger picture. And you needed to commit resources behind an idea or it won't go anywhere. And that's not just money, it's political capital. And you, you have to build up that political capital first. And so uh, he pays very close attention to those relationships, uh, including uh, I was intrigued to learn uh, on our day of infamy, uh, November 22nd, 1963, on the assassination of President Kennedy, earlier that morning, he called to express birthday wishes to John Nance Garner, right, FDR's first VP, uh, who I believe is turning 93 or 95, something in that, in that range. And, uh, you know, a real student of history and a real, uh, a person who really pays attention to relationships does those personal touches throughout. In, in addition to being a good, you know, large-scale retail politician, those personal touches to individuals, I think, uh, made a huge difference throughout his career. And I'm sure Eleanor had no affection for John Nance Garner. <laughs> no, she wasn't a huge fan. But, uh, but well, what's interesting is that despite all the work that Eleanor Roosevelt had done with the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and her years of work with the United Nations, uh, JFK puts her in charge of, well, puts her on the, the commission on the status of women. Yes. Um, yeah. Understanding that at this moment in time, you know, this idea of, of 
equality for women and including women, more women into the, the political establishment uh, to stop some of the um, discrimination that was being leveled against women in all the industries. And I think it's very interesting that he would appoint her in that role um, because I think it went to one of her passions, which was, you know, she had fought for gender equality her whole, you know, adult life. And I think it's a brilliant pick, and I think Eleanor did a brilliant job with it. And, uh, and I think uh, it, the, the subject came up repeatedly in his press conferences. Uh, he, was, he, he may not have appointed as many women to senior leadership roles as we would expect to see today, but the level to which he did involve women in his administration uh, was somewhat of a breakthrough for his time, and certainly the appearance of women journalists in his, in the press pools that he interacted with, and many of them called him to account for what is what are you going to do to continue your campaign pledge of equal rights for women and equal pay for women and equal roles and and all that, and and I think. Uh, you know, I think by today's standards, we would say coulda, shoulda, woulda done more. But by it, for those times, I think that uh, he did some amazing things. So Eleanor Roosevelt dies in uh, November 1962. Um, and uh, JFK comes back up to Hyde Park along with Harry Truman and, you know, every major political figure in America to pay his respects at her funeral. Um, and I think there is a true sincerity at that moment to the passage of this great woman and his acknowledgement of her role in the creation and establishment of the Democratic Party. Um, but I also think it's a um, honor that he felt that she had earned. I can't, uh, I can't find words that ac accurately capture uh, Eleanor's significance uh, to the Democratic Party, to the nation, and to President Kennedy's um, uh, ascension to the presidency. She paves the way and influences so many people. Uh, you, obviously, he can't have FDR support at that, at that point. FDR is, is long gone. But Eleanor uh, is able to bridge that gap. Well, we'll end with the thought about the fact that both of these men, JFK and FDR, essentially gave their lives um, in, in duty to the country. Uh, I think in both cases, they're uh, death in office um, created a resonance with the American people that has uh, stayed with us all these years. Um, and I think that there is a something missing in today's politics in that both of these people truly believed in public service. Uh, they, they had been raised with the sense that they had a, a duty and a responsibility to serve the American people, and they both did in very, very extraordinary ways. And, uh, you know, I think... John F. Kennedy's inaugural address remains one of the greatest speeches of all time. I have to agree, uh, and I have to say, FDR and the events of his time as president shaped the nation, shaped that generation in profound ways. Uh, president Kennedy, even Nixon is uh, only three years older than Kennedy, and uh, later President Bush, uh, Herbert Walker Bush, is only six years older than Kennedy, and World War II shapes them. Uh, and so many other Kennedy siblings serve in the war, uh, either in the military or in uh, civilian roles. And, uh, and I think uh, President Kennedy would encourage us, uh, were he alive today, to always uh, value public service and consider public service in its many forms as a way to strengthen the nation and make the world better for the people around us. Alan, I, that's a great place to end today's conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it. You're doing a great job up there at JFK, and I hope you have a great year. Paul, always great to talk. I look forward to visiting Hyde Park again soon. Thank you, and that's it for today. We hope to see you again in the future.